a recognition of the accumulation of performances over a long time, being consistent over 16 years at the elite senior level. The commissaires decided that had that collision not have happened, I would have carried momentum through to win that race. So they took the win off of her in front of a home crowd and, and gave it to me. The one thing I found challenging over a really long career was that um, and successful career was that my psyche shifted from at the start loving trying to win to at the end fearing what happened when I didn't. As we sort of chipped away and, and the days went by we sort of found that you know having a bit of time off was going to be the best thing to do so um, that's exactly what we did. I'm the one with the target on my back you know I'm, I'm the defending Paralympic champion and world champion so I'm the one to beat and, and I, I always have to remember that everyone else is chasing me. Amazing, amazing, amazing. to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Our mission is to protect the integrity of sport and the health and welfare of those who participate in Australian sport. Hello and welcome to Onside. I'm Tim Gable. This is the first episode in our Clean and Gold series in the lead up to the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. And alongside me for this series is the triple Olympic gold medalist and Sport Integrity Australia's Assistant Director Engagement, Patria Thomas. And Patria, you've got plenty of highlights, three Olympic gold medals. What's the, the best memory that you have of the Olympic Games? Oh, look, Tim, it's um, the Olympics is a very special thing to be involved with and it was so exciting to get to participate in not just one, but three, thankfully, uh, during a fairly long career for me. And I think um, obviously just chasing that elusive gold of a, a goal of a gold medal in the Olympic Games um, was what kept the, the fire burning in me. And I was fortunate enough to achieve that at my third Games. Is it almost a relief at the finish when you finished Athens? Do you, do you think, oh, job done, relief? Uh, yeah, there was certainly a, a massive mixture of emotions from Athens. Um, I mean, relief was definitely one of them, that I had uh, achieved the goal that I'd set myself all those years ago. And, um, you know, just the excitement of being there and being part of it and being in that environment where you're walking around and, and seeing, you know, amazing athletes from all over the world. So a number of teams have been selected now in the lead up to Tokyo for the Paralympics and also the Olympic Games. What do they do now? Is it all about just fine-tuning your preparation, tapering? What happens now? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's obviously, you know, just over a month or so to go and uh, it's really just about the fine-tuning uh, part of it now. I think all the, the physical preparation is done um, and it's really a matter of getting in the right mindset to perform when it matters the most. All right. Looking forward to having you along for this series, the Clean and Gold series on On Side. And today we'll be speaking with Australian para canoeist Curtis McGrath, who took up the sport after losing both his legs in a mine blast while serving in the Australian Army in Afghanistan. And Curtis won gold in the 2016 Rio Paralympics and he's won 10 World Championship gold medals. Also joining us, the legendary Australian cyclist Anna Mears. Anna is a four-time Olympian winning two Olympic gold medals eight years apart. She was also the first woman to win gold for Australia in track cycling at the Olympic Games and a retired from competitive cycling in 2016. So joining us as our special guests very shortly, Anna Mears and Curtis McGrath. And Mears coming up to the line, she's going to hold up the challenge. Mears makes it golden gold here in the period. Mears, now she goes for it at second wheel. She's coming on the outside, Pendleton in front. Mears on the outside, they get close, oh very close! Whoa. Pendleton leads, Mears tries to jump her down the back straight and she's got her on the outside. Anna Mears goes to the lead, Pendleton I think is a spent force, it's Anna Mears' goal wreck! I'm Tim Gable, this is Onside alongside triple Olympic gold medalist and Sport Integrity Australia's Assistant Director Engagement, Patria Thomas for the Clean and Gold series. And our guest is the most decorated female track sprint cyclist in history, Anna Mears. Anna won two Olympic gold medals, the first in 2004 and the second in London in 2012. And also won 11 world titles across four different disciplines. And thank you very much for joining Onside's Clean and Gold series. And I imagine for the first time in a while, you're not preparing for an Olympic Games. It must be a totally different feeling. 
Well, firstly, thank you for having me. And uh, yes, it is a very, very different feeling um, not being in the competitive sense of an Olympic Games, but I am doing my preparations to commentate, which will be a very different experience. Um, this year's Games in Tokyo obviously is nothing but the norm. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that I've had my career prior to, but looking forward to commentating current athletes' experiences. How hard is it going to be put to put your experiences in, into, I guess, what is happening in, in front of your eyes in, in terms of television? Uh, I've had a little bit of practice and the thing that I have found most challenging about commentating is articulating quickly what I see um, because as an athlete, obviously, we are trained to act as opposed to talk. So, <laughs> yep. um, But what I have enjoyed is being able to simplify my sport because um, I know a lot of people in my retirement have asked me, why, why is your event called the sprint when you go so slow? Um, so explaining the tactical and uh, technical side of my sport, um, I get great enjoyment of. And with all the research you're doing um, in preparation for the Games, um, what are our prospects looking like for the cycling team in Tokyo? Look, the prospects, I think, in Tokyo are very promising. Um, sadly, we did lose our most su successful uh, female sprinter since um, I retired and Steph Morton to, uh, she chose to retire with the postponement of the Games. Um, and with that probably went three chances of Olympic medals. Um, that being said, uh, Carly McCulloch is still looking very strong for the individual women's events and uh, and the men's team sprint has certainly come up significantly with the extra 12 months um, in the delay of the Games happening. And of course, our team pursuit squads are always very, very strong. Uh, it's just a matter of waiting to see what the rest of the world has done with the 12 months off because it's been very difficult, as you can understand, to get any form of racing. I guess why your story resonates uh so much with the the Australian public is, um, I guess, uh, growing up in central Queensland, having it to, to do it the hard way, you, you, know, you didn't go to the AIS initially. And then, of course, in 2008, won the silver medal seven months after breaking your neck in the World Cup in Los Angeles, you came back. And then, of course, in 2012, won your second Olympic gold medal. You're such a fighter. And I guess that's what people love about you. Um, do you... You still got that fighting qualities, I imagine, in everything <laughs> you do, not just oh, cycling. Yes. yes, yes, I do. Don't put me in a board game. I want to flip tables. It's um, <laughs> yeah, I do. It's um, look, I really appreciate the connection I've had with the Australian public over my career, and and I appreciate it's been you know a number of things, like you said, the the resilience, connection, the fighting spirit that I've shown. But I think I've also been very honest with um, my experiences and my emotions along the way. And um, and I've learned to be able to articulate it, I think, for people to be able to connect um, with me and what I've been through and what, what I've, I have went through as an athlete. And um, I really appreciated and loved all of the support that I received over a long career. Um, and I know the value of, of representing Australia in those green and gold colours, um, what that means to the Australian public. And and now that I'm retired, I'm one of those people again. So, you know, I will be cheering as much as everyone else will be at home. And you've had an amazing career. Um, can I ask what your proudest moment is? Mm. Um, I, I think that my proudest moment was being flag bearer in Rio because it wasn't performance based in result. And I feel like that kind of wasn't a recognition of the accumulation of performances over a long time, being consistent over 16 years at the elite senior level as being at the Olympics and world championships every year and being on the podium. Um, I feel like that's my greatest achievement. Um, but if I was to pick a, a performance result it's really hard to go past the silver in Beijing in hindsight, even though it's not gold. And I know my London gold is is probably, you know, result-wise the best. But for what I went through and still being able to achieve, I think that silver in Beijing is the highlight. Yeah, it was an amazing comeback. But I do just want to touch on the uh, the amazing race in London to de dethrone Victoria Pendleton, um, who had mm. been um, fairly well untouchable in, in the – uh, years previous to the Games. How satisfying was it to, I suppose, build the plan and then see that plan come to fruition? 
<laughs> Unbelievably satisfying. Um, Victoria was the best in the world, and I don't say that lightheartedly. I mean, she was undefeated for six years on the international scene. That's how good she was. And it took an incredible team with a great foresight for understanding change and implementing change um, in order to make me better because she, as the best in the world, was not going to get worse. It was up to me to make the changes to be competitive um, at her home Olympics in 2012. And she set the benchmark. So I had to do the the hard work and the leg work. Um, and, you know, as, as you would understand, a four-year preparation, not just physically, but mentally, tactically, technically, when it happens to cut, go right on race day, um, you know, you get that one shot every four years to get it right. It, it really was special. Um, what made it more special was the fact that the Australian Olympic team in London was not experiencing its usual level of, of gold medal success. And um, that was one of only seven golds won in those games by any Australian. And all of the expat Aussies living in London were so thankful to finally have something to serve back to their British counterparts. <laughs> so I was happy to uh, be able to facilitate that. Yes, you mentioned their tactics, the famous standstill tactic um, in one of those races. But let's go to race one where it was a photo finish uh, and we'll go into the aftermath of that. Here's, here's race one. Mears, now she goes for it at second wheel. She's coming on the outside. Pendleton in front. Mears on the outside. They get close. Oh, very close. Whoa. I can't pick it. I think if any, I think if anything, Victoria Pendleton on the inside. It was a tie within it. They got extremely close in the home straight. Can you tell us the aftermath of that? We all know, but we'd love to hear it from you. Yeah, well, ultimately I lost that race by one one thousandth of a second. And if you don't know the measurement of that time frame, it is the width of a lead pencil line drawn on a piece of paper. So you can imagine four years of preparation by a enormous amount of people um, to miss by the width of a lead pencil line was was pretty winding, I guess you could say, in a descriptive sense. Um, but I was still very confident that I had the ability to win. Obviously, the individual sprint is a best of three matchup, so you do have to beat your opponent twice, and I still had an opportunity to come back at Vicky Pendleton. Um, but by the time I got to the to, to the warm-down rollers, um, an announcement was made over the speakers that Victoria had been relegated for impeding the line of, of her opponent, meaning that at a point about 30 metres before the finish, we physically collided, which you're allowed to do in our sport, but you can't do it whilst crossing certain safety lines on the track. And at point of contact, Pendleton had crossed the sprinter's lane, the red line on the track by four boards or 10 centimetres. And uh, the commissaires decided that had that collision not have happened, I would have carried momentum through to win that race. So they took the win off of her in front of a home crowd and, mm. and gave it to me. <laughs> brave decision. Um, which is very brave. was met by 6,000 boos, I can guarantee you. Um, and that sent sh shivers down my spine. But, you know, it, it, it's the way our sport goes. And um, you really have to learn to not be hung up on things you can't control. And, and the biggest one is commissaire decisions. Well, tell us then about the tactics in the – in the gold medal race where it virtually came to a standstill because she doesn't like to lead. So you wanted her to come in front and, and to do that, you, you you had to virtually become stationary, didn't you? Yeah. So we, we had the perfect storm really because in the first race um, you you randomly draw for which position you hold and she, or she randomly drew the front, which was perfect. We didn't have to execute this tactic until race two. And uh, in race two, I was leading. Um, it was a position I didn't want to be in because our analysis had given us the inf information that um, this was my weakest chance to win and her strongest, sorry, weakest chance to win and her strongest. Um, so we chose to implement or execute a skill called the track stand, which is just stopping and balancing the bike in a stationary position. And we trialled this a, a year and a half out from London against Vicky in the semi-finals of the World Championships um, in Appledorn, and it was successful. And then we didn't use it again 
domestically or internationally to try and throw them off our scent of what tactics we would would use um, until we met in that final for race two. And uh, she just didn't anticipate it, wasn't able to execute under pressure um, and finding herself one down with two laps to go, having to completely change her race plan with no one to discuss that with. Um, I think I was able to capitalise on on my ability to uh, execute better than, than she did and, um, you know, ultimately won by bike length, which I think speaks volumes for the execution of a strategy because physically there was nothing between us. And a lot can be made about the rivalries between, uh, I suppose, arch enemies on, on, on the sporting com- uh, competition field. How was your relationship with Victoria and, um, you know, was it friendly or, or respectful or I know a lot has been said about my, uh, you know, I had a great rivalry with uh, fellow Australian Susie O'Neill in, in the swimming. Um, but I know from my perspective, it was all full of full of respect. Yeah, it. um it was intense, I'll give you that. Um, and I think the circumstances made it the perfect concoction for hype and, you know, Aussie versus Brit tension in the past. No one really kind of knew where um, the relationship lay. And even I didn't know, you know, because I just – I never talked to Victoria Pendleton. It was – we were so far at the pointy end of competition internationally that – we were just so guarded um, and trying to survive in a, in a high-pressure environment, a high-pressure lead-in, um, that it wasn't until after competition, uh, you know, when she lost that final, she took my hand and, and held it raised down the whole back straight. And I think that was a great exhibit of respect and sportswomanship. And then, you know, under the track when we were being marshaled for our, our medal ceremony, it was the first time in almost a decade that we, uh, I felt – like we literally were just two people catching up um, who hadn't seen each other in a long, long time. And uh, our relationship, I think, has improved and grown with even more respect with time because her retirement after London, my retirement after Rio has afforded us some ability to almost share with each other the other 180 of our experience, which is rare because not many people – will be able to understand that full 360 experience of what each of us went through. Um, and, I, and I think that we both appreciate what each of us not only achieved but survived. Having read your book, uh, you know, fantastic career, but um, once you retired, it didn't finish there. I mean, you still had some battles after you retired, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I did a lot of preparation ready for life after sport, did all the work that – you know, had all these pathways and options available to me, but um, life happened for me between London and Rio, and no one, no one really helped me uh, comprehend the mental and emotional anguish of loss, of career, of loss and grief, of of team and environment and belonging and identity in in context of an athlete's um, position and. Not only was I dealing with that, that change and loss of career, um, I was dealing with divorce. I was dealing with the the terminal diagnosis and ultimate death of my coach, Gary West. I was dealing with a body that had been so battered and broken um, that I had to, you know, really work on treatment and, and physical health as well as mental and mental health. And, um, yeah, it was an extremely difficult transition for me. Um, I'm now five years in and I can can say I'm in, in the best place I've, I've been and I hope in a year's time I can continue to say that. Um, it's a slow process. I don't know how long it will take me and it's certainly a different time frame for every athlete pending on all the things that we, we have to process and adjust to. But, yeah, this, the sporting world and life is just such a big machine and a big world when you're in it. Um, it runs like clockwork. There is – a lot of attention and adulation and, and for me the highs were incredibly high um, so that when I stepped out of it I realised that life without that world was was in much, much bigger with far less people uh, who cared or it seemed appeared to have, who, to have cared and, and the so-called normal life felt low in comparison to what normal was for me for 24 years as an elite athlete and um, – yeah, I found that an extremely difficult thing to get my head around, but I had wonderful support 
both in psych, in family, in friends, and even in my own sport um, to ensure that that I was supported through that process and still am to this day. So, um, yeah, it's it's not easy. Change isn't easy, and and many of us can appreciate that the changes that have hit us, especially since COVID nineteen have hit the world. Um, but change can present itself in so many different forms that um, we just need to give ourselves a little bit of a break every now and then and ask for help um, in order to to survive some of these challenges that face us. I know it's great that you're still involved, um, you know, in sport. You know, you're commentating for Tokyo and I know you're a part of the team executive for Commonwealth Games uh, for our Birmingham uh, team next year. Uh, how important is it to, to you to keep in touch and, and give back to sport? I, I think it's really important um, that it's sport it doesn't, for me, or necessarily have to be cycling. And um, even though I have a love for cycling, I'm, I have dedicated and been in that circle for so long that it's it's refreshing for me to be in a different space. And by being involved with the commentary, by being involved with you, Patria, and, and supporting your role as chef for Birmingham Games and the Commonwealth Games um, Federation of Australia, it's it's fascinating for me to see it from a completely different perspective. It's fascinating to be able to offer my insights <clears throat> to to different um, ears, but also to be a set of ears and learn and absorb still um, in that environment. And that's the one thing that I do love about sport is it's a great vehicle to teach. Um, and I feel like I have been learning since I've been involved in sport from that little five-year-old girl who started with a BMX bike, you know, mm. so... Um, for me, it's nice to see that that sport has paths, pathways, and um, avenues past competition, um, and it's certainly given me an incredible perspective um, on how, how many people it takes for an athlete to gain that success. Um, I look forward to being a part of the team um, with you, Patria, for Birmingham, and contributing to the Australian athletes' success. Um, if from behind the scenes that they probably won't even know all the work that gets <laughs> to get that gets done. I certainly haven't. <laughs> it's a steep learning curve, that's for sure. Uh, one of the things I admire about you, Anna, is uh, the fact that you had so much power over your mind, over your body. I wonder whether or not, you know, being in these new roles, you might see somebody who mightn't be as motivated as you think they should be or a little bit down. You're going to be able to instill that uh, so successful um, power of the mind over body that you had when you were cycling onto other athletes, onto other people who might, who might be feeling down and might be feeling unmotivated? Well, I hope so. Um, the thing is, most people only ever saw me as an athlete when I was in moments of success. You know, that's why I think my book is really different in that it, it completes the picture of the four years that happen in between either the Commonwealth Games or the Olympic Games and the World Championships for me as an athlete because I do struggle and I do hit low points and I do have down days and my motivation gets challenged constantly. And um, it's, you know, the lessons that we I learned as an athlete that helped me, um, you know, not try to repress those moments, but actually just accept and deal with them and how learn how to move forward with them. And, um, and still to this day, I'm not perfect. I'm not hard as nails, you know, <laughs> as it, it seems to come across, which I do very much appreciate. Um, but I think sometimes to be strong, you have to be prepared to break and uh, and accept that just as in sport, you don't always win. You're going to lose more than you win. Um, as in life, you, you're going to spend more time battling than you are, you know, celebrating. So um, I think that's why it's so important to choose who you surround yourself with. And I think Patria has chosen a great team and a team executive for Birmingham in 2022. And, um, and, and likewise for the other environments I find myself in, especially, you know, I'm the rookie in all these areas now. So <laughs> if I can contribute in some positive way to, to the morale of those teams, then that's fantastic while I'm learning. You have stated that uh, success isn't about staying undefeated. It's about how you handle defeats. And, you know, I, I fully understand where you're coming from there because, um, you know, defeat can absolutely destroy you if you haven't got that power of the mind and I guess that um, is something that you carry as a little bit of a mantra don't you that success is not about staying undefeated it's about how you handle those defeats 
Yeah, yeah. You know, it's um. You said it in the start. I I've won eleven world titles in my career, but I've actually lost a further twenty nine attempts. So I've lost more than I've won in my career. Um, and if it hadn't have been for those losses, I wouldn't have been able to sit down and nut out how I could r- resist repeating those mistakes or what I, drawing out of them what I could learn or or at least learning to sit emotionally in a low spot and pull myself out um and most of us we don't we don't like those feelings so a lot of us try to avoid many people don't even put themselves in the competition to simply avoid that space but I think we as athletes and myself as an athlete uh was taught to um be uncomfortable more than I was comfortable and uh, and and as in in reference to your question earlier, it's life after sport. I've had to learn to be less analytical, um, kinder in my my critiquing of myself, um, so that I can you know enjoy life at a slower pace than what I'm used to. Um, you know, ramping up for for sporting competitions all over the world. And you had uh, success early in your career and you always had a very long career. So I was just keen to understand what kept you going all those years. I mean, four Olympics is, is pretty amazing in anyone's books. Yeah, the, the simple thing that I loved about what I did was I loved to race. And our sport isn't a high profile sport here in Australia, but racing is a really rare thing to get as a track sprinter. Road cyclists and endurance cyclists can can access competitions um, at a high level quite easily, but track sprinters and especially Australians have to travel a long way. We spend a lot of time um, away from home and family and friends in order to gain those competition experiences. And I was I was really one of those people you pin a number on, and I just you know grew to six foot tall <laughs> instead of my usual five foot four. Um, so I just loved, I, you know, I, I tolerated the slog of training because I loved the competition environment. Um, the one thing I found challenging over a really long career was that, um, and successful career was that my psyche shifted from at the start loving trying to win to at the end fearing what happened when I didn't. Um, and that took a lot of work for my sports psych and my coaching team to really help me overcome, to continue to try and deliver those high high end result performances um, in the high perform high performance environment. So um, it got harder, believe me, but I loved racing. That was what got me through. We're really looking forward to having a look at your insights into the track cycling, especially at the Tokyo Olympic Games coming up. And Patria, I know, you know, having been at the Olympics so many times, triple Olympic gold medalist. It's important, isn't it, to, to translate what is happening as people are seeing it. So you add a little bit of, you know, I guess if, you, if yourself, for, for want of a better expression. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, no one quite understands the feeling uh, mm. of what it's like to, to, to be there and represent your country and, and try and put your best um, foot forward on the day, apart from those who have done it. And yep. I think to have... Uh, former athletes um, involved in in the commentary, it yep. brings that wonderful insight uh, to 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 the action and really helps, um, I suppose, draw out some of those emotions and and tactics and and yep. everything that goes into a performance. All right, Patricia, thanks very much for that, and thank you very much to to Anna. Anna Mears joining us on onside today for our Clean and Gold series. Can't wait. For the Olympics to get underway. If anybody hasn't read your book, by the way, The Anime Story, The Fighting Spirit of a Champion, it is such an inspirational read. I recommend it to anybody. Anna, thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You're listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. This is Onside. I'm Tim Gable. Alongside me, the triple Olympic gold medalist, Patria Thomas, in the lead up to the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. And joining us now is the Rio Paralympic gold medalist in para canoe, Curtis McGrath. And Curtis also won the World Championship 10 times. He's been named in the Australian team for the Tokyo Paralympics. And Curtis, I would imagine that you had to reset after the postponed games. How did you handle that? Yeah, uh, hi. Um, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it was a bit of a, uh, a sort of spanner in the works in terms of the preparation and everything. And it was really difficult to sort of recalibrate and refocus because no one really knew what was going on and no one knew what to do. And it was very difficult to find 
sort of the right momentum and the right sort of motivation leading into it. So as we sort of chipped away and, and the days went by, we sort of found that, you know, having a bit of time off was going to be the best thing to do. So um, that's exactly what we did. So yeah, it, it, when I say time off, it was just like a lighter training load, but still, you know, maintaining fitness and, and you know, flexibility and, um, you know, keep paddling, but uh, definitely, definitely taking a, a bit of um, foot off the gas a wee bit. So, um, it, like I said, it was difficult, but, um, you know, with everyone around and everyone, you know, literally everyone's in the same position and um, understanding that, you know, we're just doing our little part to, to maintain social distancing and, um, you know, having that time to to recalibrate and refocus and, and understand that the goal is still the same, but the goalposts may, may have shifted. So, um, yeah, it was obviously a bit difficult, but um, all in all, it was um, some, sometimes a, a good thing as well. Curtis, now that you've got a confirmed date for competition and, you know, things seem to be going ahead for the Olympic and Paralympic Games, um, how, how is your mindset now? How, does that, how did that change um, when you had that sort of uh, finishing line um, in mind, so to speak? Yeah, I guess um, for me, I'm, I'm the one with the target on my back. You know, I'm, I'm the defending Paralympic champion and world champion, so... Um, despite you know the the competitions that happened in Europe and without our the Australians in t- attendance, um, I'm the one to beat and and hopefully uh, whatever I'm doing here in Australia and at home and and uh, as I focus towards that the competition, I, I always have to remember that everyone else is chasing me. So understanding that, and knowing that, and feeling that little pressure is something that you know I need to understand and, and need to be aware of because. You know, if I you know, take my sort of uh, lose focus and, and lose sort of sight of what I'm, I'm trying to achieve and do my, for myself, um, I uh, will, will no, I'll get caught up. So, you know, I, I definitely want to stand on top of the podium twice and, and that's really kept me motivated. And as I said just before, understanding the goal has changed and the, it's just the goalposts that are moved. So, um, in saying that, it's you know it's a bit of a, a long, long, long season. This will definitely be my longest season, and maintaining that motivation and focus has been um, a little bit difficult. But you know that standing on the podium is definitely going to be a, a huge motivator, and it has been throughout this period. Well, you're used to overcoming adversity, aren't you? If we can cast your <laughs> mind back to 2012 when it all changed for you, and you know, just your, your comments while on the stretcher after walking onto that mine, suggesting that you were going to be a Paralympian. You, you already had it in your mind that you, you were going to be at the Paralympics. Yeah, and, and I, like, I didn't say that with much substance and, and knowledge of what actually that meant, but um, it, it was sort of a comment to try and ease the, the minds of the guys and around me, you know, that they were also going through a pretty traumatic experience and if I could say or do something that would – maybe help them in some way um i was going to do it and you know i think that's part of the reason why i pursued the paralympic journey is was not for my own but to, to my own sort of um, um goals and, and mindset but to to show that i was still capable and um still able to to get out there and, and do things and and be a part of something so great as, as the paralympic games and you know i was just fortunate enough to have a really amazing team and recovery and and along with um, maybe a, a little bit of natural talent there, and um, it all came to a conclusion uh, in Rio and uh, with the, the the gold medal. So you know, I'm very lucky with the support and and, and help and, and you know, resources that have been provided to me in order to pursue that that little seed that I planted on that stretcher. Well, it was only four years later that you won gold at the Rio Paralympics. We might uh, see if we can hear a little bit of. Um, just the highlights again of that moment in Rio in 2016. Pulling away from his nearest rival to take gold, Curtis McGrath, you star, world champion, and now a Paralympic gold medal. Great memories. Uh, do you use that as motivation <laughs> at all, the fact that you you were so, so successful uh, after a pretty short space of time in, in competing in the sport? Um, you know, the, the feeling, I, I guess, no is the short answer. And the reason why is because the, the feelings I got when I crossed that line and won that gold medal was 
feelings that I didn't expect. I expected to be, you know, excited and celebrated and uh, not celebrated, excited and, you know, this huge sense of joy and, and excitement that, that I'd achieved that. But what I actually got was this huge wave of relief, you know, this sort of skeleton in the closet type feeling that it, it, I'd set it there and it was just hiding in there waiting for me to finish and it would pop out and be like, thank God that's over. You know, that, that was a huge journey and a huge un, unfelt pressure. But when it, when I crossed the line, that the pressure was there and it, I felt it and I sort of almost physically felt it. It was like this wave that fell on me and the relief of, you know, going through what I went through for year, over the four years and, and culminating to, to crossing that line and being, um, a gold medalist was, you know, one that I didn't expect whatsoever. So, um, I hope that, um, that feeling doesn't happen again in, in Tokyo, but at the same time, you know, the, the goal was there and I, um, was super happy to be able to, to achieve that gold medal. And it didn't sink in until I was, you know, maybe heading off to sleep that night and, and sort of you know, reliving it in my mind about the feelings and the, you know, all the people that had helped me to get to that moment was you know, all, all present in my mind and it was a really special moment. And, you know, as much as I say no, it's, it's definitely driven me to, to go on to be better now. Curtis, a lot has been uh, talked about the, the special spirit of the Paralympic team in, in Rio and um, I, I'm just wondering if you can tell us about how that helped um, lift you in your first Paralympic Games. Yeah, it is a special team. You know, we, we come from all walks of life and different backgrounds and, and much more diverse sort of backgrounds than the Olympic team. And that's just due to our upbringing and where we're from and how we acquired or, or if we were born with our disability. So you know, myself and a few others of the team, we've all acquired our disability throughout our life and understand that there's a fair bit of adversity that goes with that acquired disability. But at the same time, we have a small understanding of what it's like to live with a disability. So it's this understanding and this sort of uh, unspoken sort of camaraderie or understanding of each other that we we really, you know, connect and, and are able to, to be one mob and one team and it's really special. So, um, and, and, you know, it, it wasn't too apparent when we, when we arrived in Rio because – it was all at the Para Canoes first Paralympic Games. Um, it was a debuting sport in Rio. So coming into the team and into the village, it was you didn't really know your place. You weren't too sure of who to talk to or if you could talk to this person because they're warming up for their event. The Para Canoe events generally in the second half of the game. So we, we come in with a little bit more relaxed nature. And, and as we get towards our event, you know, it starts to sharpen up and we start to get a little bit more focused. So having that opportunity to, to see everything and, and, you know, talk to the people that aren't competing until we are as well. It's, it's a really interesting sort of dynamic, but as the games go on and we start to learn names and learn people and, um, and what they've achieved and, and who they are and where they've come from, um, it, it's really special and we're able to connect with them after our event. So it's, it is a really amazing team. Leading into um, Tokyo, obviously there's, the world is in a different place at the moment and the games will be different. Uh, what, what are your sort of expectations heading into the, the games themselves? Um, well, I think all the sports will be the same. You know, we're going there to do everything that we know how to do and a lot of people have done before. So you know, we've all competed at world level and, and that's why we're Olympians and Paralympians. And I think leading into the, the games and, and the preparation and, and everything around the actual events themselves, that's what's going to be different. You know, the, 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 the dining hall will be different. For the Australian Paralympic team, we're not using the dining hall because we've seen it as a, as a potential for exposure to COVID and we you know, decided that as uh, the, the organising for our team has decided that it'd be safer to, to eat our meals within our own accommodation accommodation block so you know, there's all these different little things i've just literally finished reading the the, the version the latest version of the playbook and having a, a little read of that and, and the processes and around the testing and it's going to be a very very different um games uh, compared to the last one and, and even you know any other games before so 
Um, uh, to be honest, it's going to be your wait and see. Um, and, you know, it, it will be difficult and some people won't enjoy it as, as in a, a games, but I think, um, you know, we're, we're there for a certain purpose and that's to compete for Australia and, and do our best. And we all know how to do that. And, um, you know, that's why we've made the cut and be uh, able to wear the green and gold. The other thing too, of course, they've added an event to your program. So there's the possibility that you could win two Paralympic gold mm. medals for the first time. Yeah, it's an exciting uh, addition to my schedule. Um, I remember crossing the line after Rio, and and I was in such good shape. I was so fit and so strong. I, you know, my my Paralympic games is all over and eighty four seconds or something like that. So. It, it felt like, and, and everyone understands that, you know, the training, we train so hard um, to, to, to get in shape for that event and for the event to be over so quickly for me, I felt I could do more and I was, you know, toying with the idea of picking up another sport. I actually tried rowing in 2017 at the national championships and, and toyed with the idea and I just, and, and the people around me and my, my sort of um, support crew, they, they were a little bit apprehensive of, of the actual load and the recovery times around rowing and going into a sprint event after, and it just probably wasn't going to work. So for me to have the opportunity to race two boats, the, the kayak firstly, and, and then the, the outrigger, the V1 uh, canoe uh, the day after is um, really exciting. And I'm you know, chewing it a bit to have the opportunity uh, to race at the Paralympic Games in that boat because it's a boat that I've never actually been beaten in. So mm. I'm um, yeah super hopeful and um, you know um, there is is a lot of uh, competition out there that's come through the woodwork over the last you know, eighteen months and or even two years and um, you know it'd be exciting to race and you know, I love to compete so having two opportunities is is just as exciting. Your backstory is going to be part of the the promotion in the lead up to the Tokyo Paralympics. How do, how do you feel about having to revisit it time and time again? to talk about what happened in 2012 and losing both legs. Does it play on your mind or do you use it as motivation? Because a lot of people will use your story as inspiration. They'll say, well, you know, there's a bloke that is doing something that we're not sure that we could do. Yeah, I, I guess that, that's a, a pretty rewarding thought. I, I think, you know, if me having that story and, and maybe using that story for someone else's benefit, I think it's really, really special. And I'm, I'm quite honoured that, that someone would have that um, ability to, to, to gain something from it. And I, that's, you know, I do a bit of public speaking uh, and telling my story, and I, that's what I hope that people take away and you know, find some inspiration and some sort of drive to overcome their own adversity through learning and, and understanding my plights of, of life. And uh, I guess, you know, it is – it was difficult to tell my story at the beginning and, you know, as it, as time goes by, by uh, I'm more able to tell my story with, with, you know, fluid words and, and, you know, not have to get emotional about it. And it is a, a, a very sort of traumatic and emotional journey to, to tell my story. But over, over the years, I've been able to, to tell it to a lot of people. And, and I hope that, everyone's taken something away from it and you know i'm more than happy for for people to use it as as uh, their own little tool and um you know for myself uh, i do see it as, as something that you know I've, I've gone through worse and i know what a bad day is and i understand that you know despite what happens on the event day it, it, life goes on and uh, I think it's it's a really um, good perspective piece of my life and i understand like i said what a bad day is really they talk about sport often as, you know, going into battle. Well, you actually have been on the battlefield and experienced that. So I was just wondering, is there any sort of transferable skills that you learnt on the battlefield that you can take into your competition that really help you? Um, this is a question I get asked quite often when I do my public speaking. And, and to be honest, I, I think it's just understanding that, you know, hard work does pay off and, no, not necessarily on competition day because I think the competition day is so specific to that event and that you know of sport and and even everyone else's sport. It's very sort of different when when you go into a competition day. Um, but the training, especially, you know, lots of grinding, lots of early, that like sort of making yourself uncomfortable, and that's important to to make sure that when you come to event day, 
you're ready for anything. You're you're ready for the the headwind. You're ready for the tailwind. You're ready for a bad start. You're ready for some disappointment and the heat, and and then being able to have come through and and have um, a really good race when it matters. And you know sometimes that doesn't happen. But as long as you're trying your best, and I think from the military, you know, you're not given all the resources in the world to make the you know, achieve the mission. But as a collective and as a team, you're able to come through and. Um, you know, achieve that mission and, and um, sort of achieve that goal as well. So, um, the, you know, the military has definitely uh, taught me how to communicate and, and understand that um, different people have different ways of doing things. And, and that's really important to learn and uh, understand that you know, there's many different ways to do something. So you might as well listen to them and, and under, try and understand their perspective and understanding of it. And, and that, you know, that's relating to a coach or a you know, physiologist or a physio. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really great that I've, I've been able to experience my, um, the military life and, and bring some skills across. Yes, because you said that you won the gold medal. When you won the gold, you said it, it wasn't just for you, but the, the people that supported you, including the military, and you donated your, your, your Rio Paralympic gold medal to the Australian War Memorial. And it's a chance for people to go and see uh, you know, some, something tangible, I guess, um, following your mm. success in Rio. Yeah, like, as I said, you know, crossing that line, it was the relief, I think, of all the people that had supported me, you know, from from the guys who carried the stretcher, the chopper pilots, the doctors, the, the physios, the prosthetist, and then my family and friends as well. And having those people there with me was was really special. And, and then to achieve that gold medal and have it, as as a display piece at the Australian War Memorial, I was able to pass my story on um, even more. And, and and I think having um, my story there proves that you know the power of sport to to overcome adversity and, and um, have uh, good support and recovery and resources around you, you can achieve uh, some really amazing things. All right, Curtis, thanks very much for joining us on onside today and um, all the best at the Tokyo Paralympics and it's an incredible story we'll all be watching and cheering um, in two events it is a little bit different for you and, and the whole thing's a little bit different let's face it <laughs> but we are really looking forward to watching you in action thanks very much for joining us on onside today thank you very much cheers I'm Dr. Larry Treese and I'm a sport and exercise medicine physician and the medical advisor at Sport Integrity Australia. I've supported our athletes to clean and gold performances as an Australian Olympic team doctor at the Rio and Sochi Games and as a Paralympic team doctor in Beijing. My three tips for competing clean are get good advice. Use the Sport Integrity Australia app and check in with your sport or team doctor and sports dietitian. Follow a food first approach no one ever tested positive to broccoli. And if you're unsure, don't take it. Don't risk your reputation. Thanks for listening to Onside's Clean and Gold podcast. There'll be plenty more in the lead up to the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. And a reminder, the Tokyo 2020 course, designed for athletes competing in the Olympics and Paralympics, and anyone interested in the rules of the Games, is available online at the Sport Integrity Australia website. You've been listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Send in your podcast questions or suggestions to media at sportintegrity.gov.au. For more information on Sport Integrity Australia, please visit our website, www.sportintegrity.gov.au, or check out our Clean Sport app.